Hi, I'm Jeremy, and today we're going to take a look at the 33rd in my series on the Spiel des Jahres, or German Game of the Year award winners. And this is going to be the 1998 winner of the award. It is Elfin Land. This is the Elfin Roads version, which is the newest uh, publication of it. The original game was called Elfin Land. This version just has Elfin Land as well as two variants included in it. And this is a game that's designed by Alan Moon, who's most famous for designing Ticket to Ride. And in many ways, this is the predecessor to Ticket to Ride. A lot of the concepts in this game were later seen in that game. And this game's going to play for two to six players. The box has ages 13 and up. I think that. That's incredibly wrong. That, yeah, I think younger players could certainly play this. And it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to play. It's a game where players are going to be controlling elves who are on a pilgrimage trying to move across a map and hit as many cities as they can before the end of the game. Let me take a minute to show you how the game works, and then I'll come back and let you know what I think about it set up a two-player game of Elfin Land, and I should note that this is using the Elfin Roads version of the game, which includes Elfin Land as one of the variants. And this game, it does uh, play up to six player. I've only set up a two-player game. Generally, it is a better game with more players. And the goal of this game is each player is going to control an elf represented by one of these boots who's basically taking a pilgrimage across the land of Elfin Land, trying to visit as many of these cities as possible. You see that each player has a cube in each city and as they visit each city they will collect those cubes. The player who's collected the most cubes at the end of the game will win. Um, the game is typically played over three rounds according to these rules. I believe though that my old rules of the old version of the game had the game played over four rounds. I would suggest playing over four rounds. I've only played the old version. I've recently upgraded to this new version. I haven't played this version yet, but I think the rules are mostly the same. So the game's three or four rounds depending on the length of the game you want. The game also comes with a variant, which I would highly suggest, where players are going to draw one of these random town cards at the start of the game, and they will just hold on to it at the end of the game. And at the end of the game, their score will be a total of the number of cubes that they've collected and the number of spaces that they need to travel to get to this town which serves as their destination. That just adds another strategic consideration to the game and it, it really doesn't add much more complication. So the way that the game is going to go is it's going to be played over three or four rounds like I said depending on the variant that you want to play and each player is going to be giving one of these legends which shows the various modes of transportation that you could use to travel across the land as well as the cost that it will take on the various types of terrain so for example to you cross the desert using a unicorn you would need to pay two unicorn cards whereas to cross the desert using the dragon would only take one dragon card so these will vary over the uh, various terrain types so this map is just you know made up of those terrain types so it's really a route planning game and the uh, rounds is going to be fate dealt is going to be divided into several sections first of all players are going to get eight travel cards and these are these cards which show the various types of travel so for example unicorn or coach or uh, goblin drawn carriage and then um, Players, if they had cards left over from previous rounds, will only get dealt back up to eight at the start of the round. And then players are going to draw face down one of these transportation tokens, which they'll be using to define the type of transportation that can be used on a given road. So each player will draw one of those and keep it in secret face down. So this player drew one of these buggies, and this player here drew one of these goblin carriages. So after that, You'll notice that there's five tiles here face up, and I'm not sure that you could clearly see them, so I'll bring them up closer. And they depict the various types of transit. So on a player's turn, they could pick one of these, or they could draw from the pile. And if one of these is picked, one gets refilled. So essentially, players are going to look at the cards that they have and look at the possible routes that they might take and draft these tiles. So I'm going to do this very quickly, not really planning ahead. Um, but this is how the game will work. So starting with the first player, they'll take one. One will come out and flip up. This player, um, let's see, they have two dragons, so maybe they'll take the dragon. And th these would be kept face up in front of the player, except for the one that was drawn and face down. That would stay face down. The player could look at, but the other players don't know what it is. So this player doesn't have clouds, 
has one unicorn, maybe they'd take the, or has two unicorns, so they'd take the unicorn perhaps. And then this comes out, this player has boars, so they might take the boars. And another one comes out, this player does not have boars, does not have, already has a carriage card. Um, but maybe they'll take a second carriage. And one more will come out, and this player, let's see, maybe they just choose to take another boar. So that would end the drafting phase. Each player like would take four total of these tiles, one face down, the others face up, unless they did not want to take one of the face up ones, they would then draw one from the face down pile and flip it face up. You could carry over one of these from round to round, I should note, so sometimes you will have five during a round. And then um, after that's done, now players in turn order again will begin placing these tiles onto the various routes on the board to define which type of transit can be used on a given road. So this player, for example, here, they might want to go, well, let's see, they want to end up back here, which is up, up here. So that, that, that's where their ideal end point would be. So they might want to go down around this way. So to go on this road here, you could see that it's essentially a uh, plains. So it it's counts as this first type. They could spend boars, their buggy, clouds, the goblin, or a dragon. And they have two buggy tiles, so maybe they would just say that this road is going to be traveled by buggy. So although the, on this, this sheet, you know, you could see that you could use all those different modes of transportation to travel on the type of road. Once a player places a tile down on that road, you could only play buggy cards unless you're going to do what's called a caravan action, which is discard any three cards of any type to move along that road. So um, that would take that, that player's action. Now this player could either play one or pass, and I should note that if you ever pass, you could come back later, later in the round when placing these tiles. It's only once all players have consecutively passed that this phase will end. So this player, they might want to go this way, and I should note that there are these lake and river tiles, or spaces on the board, and the rivers have an arrow, which depicts the, depict the um, direction that the river flows in. And those do not require these to move on. They're the only type of, of road that you can move on without those. To move on the lake requires two um, of these raft tiles or raft cards. To, to uh, move on the river going downstream costs one and to move on the river going upstream costs two. So this player might wanna use this river, which I've somewhat obscured here, to travel. So for example, they might go over here using, again, that road they could travel on, I believe with their boar. Yeah, so they would be able to do that with one boar card. So they might place that. So now this player is considering how to get here. They could just place another one of those, for example. Now I go back to this player. They might use the boar to go here. Then it would go to this player. They have to get through those mountains, which let's see, they could use a unicorn. That would be fine. And each player is also going to get, for the entire game, one of these hazard tokens. And you could use those on your turn to essentially make somebody's life harder. You would place that here, and now this player would have to spend one extra card, or any player who uses this road would have to spend one extra card to go across that. I should definitely clarify that anybody could use this road as long as they use boar cards but again you have to use boar cards to use that road so this player has this this and they'll be able to use their river cards to go here and here so now they might for example worry about how to get through these mountains here and i believe they would be able to do that with their dragon so they might place the dragon all the way over here this player would end up here now and they don't have a boar to go across here, but perhaps they'd be able to go on this route with this goblin cart. So this planning phase, it definitely requires a lot of forward uh, thinking. And sometimes this can take a moment or two. I'm just, like I said, playing pretty haphazardly. It looks like this player would be stuck in these mountains here with no particularly good move, so they might choose to pass and just retain this tile for the next round. And this player has played all their tiles, so now they would have to pass as well. That would end this phase. And so now in turn order, players are going to be able to play their, their cards to take all the moves that are possible given the um, movement options on the board. 
So the way that this is going to work, and let me just move this player's cards out of the way to help explain, um, is this player, again, they're not obligated to take any of the roads that they've laid down, and they can go as far as they want. So again, referring back to uh, this sheet, you could see here they could travel on this road with just one buggy card. So they would play the buggy card to the discard pile and be able to move this here and collect this cube. They would then play another buggy card to move the next space, again, claiming a cube. Um, then here to go to use the uh, unicorn in the mountains, cost one, they have one, discard that, go here. Then they could use this, um, they don't have this, but they do have one of these goblin carts, so moving along the uh, road with that costs one, and they just go here, take that, and let's see, they don't have a river card to go along here. Unfortunately, there's no tile placed here, so even though they have dragons which would allow them to travel in the mountains, they do not have a tile placed here, so they can't travel any further, and it looks like that would end their journey. If they wanted to, they could actually spend the goblin tile to go back to this city. You can go back and forth on a road as long as you had the card. So, I mean, they could use the goblin card with this goblin tile to go back, but um, that would not necessarily be a good move for them. So they might choose to just stop at that point. They would retain these cards. They would retain up to one tile that they would have for the next round. So going back to this player, Again, they would probably choose to use their boar to go here, pick up this cube, use the boar again to go down here, pick up that cube, then use the river, and since they're going downstream, it'll just cost one raft card per space. So they'll play two and go one, two, picking up cubes along the way. Then here, they want to go through these mountains. They have to play a dragon to do that. And that just costs one dragon card. And now they've run out of tiles again. They could use a dragon to go back to here if they wanted to go get these spaces, which might not be a terrible move. So let's just say that they do that and go back to here and choose to end their turn. Again, they would retain the cards that they haven't played as well as the one tile that they have not played. Now that would basically initiate the, the rounds end and you would just do a cleanup phase. All right, so now just to clean up at the end of the round, you would remove all of these and they would just get returned to this face down pile, which would get reshuffled. If anybody had played obstacle tiles, uh, they would just get removed from the game entirely. You'll switch out this wrong round card to show that you've played it, you know, you've passed the round. And then um, again, players would get that dealt back up to eight cards and the uh, start player marker would go to the next player. So that would be it. Eight players would get eight cards, they draft more of these tiles, and then they would continue their journeys across Elfinland. At the end of the game, you'll simply count up who's collected more of these cubes. And again, with the variant, which I would definitely recommend, you would subtract the number of spaces that they are from this destination city, and that would give them their total score. Whoever has the most points would be the winner. In the case of a tie, whoever's closest to their destination city would win. All right, so that is Elfin Lands, as I still call it. And I will say that this new version is nice. I might actually prefer, even though I've gotten rid of my old version, I might actually prefer this the map of the old version. But this one's fine. It, it's you know relatively legible. It's just the old one it was very easy to see the roads, whereas here sometimes they're a little bit more difficult to see. But this game does come with three variants in the box, so I haven't played the uh, third yet, the Elfin Golds variant. But you know it is good that to have that variety in the box. So I'm not terribly upset about my upgrade. In any case, I think that this is a game, especially for fans of Ticket to Ride, where you would be able to see a lot of the concepts from that game that later resurfaced in Ticket to Ride. And although this game um, does you know, recycle the basic premise of route building, it has a similar drafting mechanism for the way that you get tiles, which is similar to the way that you get the train cards in Ticket to Ride. Um, this is a game that I feel stands on its own and is still worth playing even with Ticket to Ride out. It's a game that definitely requires more forward thinking than Ticket to Ride because you essentially have to plan your entire turn at the start of the game. And it's a game that requires that encourages piggybacking in a way that Ticket to Ride doesn't. In Ticket to Ride, unless you're using, I suppose, the Europe expansion with those um, those hubs pieces, which I forget what they're called, stations, I think. Um, 
that game really requires you to claim a route just for yourself. Here, ideally, you're going to piggyback off of each other's routes as players place those route tile tokens down onto the board. Um, although they're defining, you know, what cards can be played on that route, they are also opening it up for your potential use. So a player who's going to succeed in this game is going to be able to capitalize on that that at those actions of the other players which makes us very distinct from ticket to ride um and i think that that also makes this game a game that plays better with more players the box it says from two to six i would really suggest playing this with more four five or six players versus two or three just because there's more potential for you to interact with other players if you play with a two-player game with one player going off to one side of the map and one player going off to the other side of the map, there will be very little interaction and the game will really be more an exercise about who draws the better cards and the better tiles, you know, in synergy as far as who will be successful. So if, the, but if the game is really, you know, interactive, that definitely changes the dynamics of it. One thing that I'll say is that I noticed that this version of the rules has these, um, the four round thing as a variant. Um, I think that the game typically has played with four rounds. I did not double check that, but I, I believe that it plays better if you play with more rounds. And I definitely think that the so-called variant to have a ending city in mind at the start of the game definitely improves the game and it makes the game differentiated for each player. And that I think is um, almost an essential variant. You'll want to play with that every time that you play the game. Something that's not listed in the rule book as a variant is the idea to use those obstacle tiles. And I certainly prefer to play the game without them. It just makes the game com more confrontational to plop those down in front of somebody. Again, it does allow you to catch up and mitigate that luck somewhat, but at the same time, it just feels a little bit mean. Um, I see the strategic purpose of including them, and you do only get one per game, but I prefer a friendlier game, and I just leave them out of the game, and the game doesn't particularly suffer for it. If somebody else gets lucky, that's just their good luck. We don't mind. We're not super competitive when we play. But all in all, this is, I think, a really terrific game. It's um, very appealing. The objective is very clear. And at the same time, it requires real strategy in how you're going to accomplish your movement goals each round. Um, again, there is some luck it appended onto that strategy, so it's not always the case that the best player is going to win, but that sometimes becomes a good equalizer, I think. Overall, this is a game that I think is held up very well, again, despite the fact that Ticket to Ride, which is pretty similar, has uh, come out in later years. Um, and the newest version, like I said, comes with three three variants in the box, so you can make it more complex if you want. The Elfin Golds variant, I believe it adds uh, bidding and whatnot and money management. So if you really want to make this more of a strategic game, that option is there if you buy the newest version of the game. So all in all, I would say that Elfin Land is a worthy Spiel des Jahres winner. And those are my thoughts on it. So thanks for watching.